Welcome, ladies and gentlemen at home. And also a very warm welcome to the few people here right at our via, uh, venue. And I would like to welcome you to our presentation series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, which we have run for three years now. We're listening to great speakers, and of course, we talk to them. We, that is the Alexander von Humburg Institute for Society and Internet, and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, a joint venture uniting great academic expertise and great awareness in order to communicate digital topics that are of great concern to all of us. I would like to thank the Alexander von Humburg Institute, Christian Katzenbach, and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, Sascha Scheyer, the hosting organization with Christian Graufogel. I would like to thank you for having me here. So it sounds a bit like we are men only, but I'm talking about the operational level only and the bosses, they are all women. And if I'm not mistaken, we have 50% women and 50% men speaking here at our lecture series. And you can have a look at our YouTube channel where you can listen to all of the other presentations. We speak German because our guest is from Germany, but we'll have two interpreters here at our venue. And later on, um, we, you will be able to listen to the English translation, listening to the recording. And I would also like to thank the interpreters. And after the presentation, making digitalization work for the climate, the two of us will be here at stage. And then we will discuss your question. You can use our participation tool, slider.com. And if you look at our stream, you can see this tool and you can ask your question and they can be downvoted or upvoted and we'll have a spokesperson here that will read out your question so that we can have a discussion with you so you can enter your question into your mobile device and we're warming up the router um, with our streaming and then maybe our guest can tell us how many terabyte hours were needed in order to produce and use iPhones or other smartphones. And the share of emissions of our devices has increased from 2.5% to 4% between 2013 and 2020, even though the devices themselves have has become much more efficient. In Germany, 8% um, of our energy consumption is used up by the production and use of these devices worldwide it's 10 percent so even though technology is becoming ever more efficient and there's less co2 emissions well we will overcompensate this saving potential because we will we have the internet of things or industrial internet of things so this is not only about fridges ordering white wine all by themselves but this is about the total digitalization of the manufacturing industry. So this is a kind of celebrity death match between the environment and growth. Is it really possible to have green growth? Maybe we need negative growth. Maybe digitalization can really help us. Or maybe we need more people to participate and to get involved in order to actually achieve the goal that ICT will help us reduce CO2 emissions by 20% by 2030, especially when it comes to mobility and logistics. But these are just a few questions and topics that we would like to deal with when looking at our guest. Our guest wrote a book with Stefan Lange um, two years ago, Smart Green World, Making Digitalization Work for Sustainability. Our guest is Professor for Social Ecological Transformation and Sustainable Digitalization at the Technical University of Berlin and at the Einstein Center Digital Future. He's a professor and researcher on climate policy, trade policy, sustainable um, economics, global justice and digital transformation. And since 2016, he has been the head of the research group Digitalization and Social Ecological Transformation at the Technical University of Berlin and at the Institute for Ecological and Economic Research. And I'm really looking forward to the presentation of Tillman Santarius.
The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Toby Müller, for the friendly introduction. Well, distinguished audience, it is really great to stand in front of uh, this audience, but I would also like to welcome those who have joined us online and who are those who have to stay at home. And our topic is making digitalization work for the climate. This is actually the title of our book, Smart Green World, Making Digitalization Work for Sustainability. Today I would like to focus on climate policy and there are five principles that I would like to present to you because I only have 25 minutes and I hope that we will have a discussion later on. So my first idea is digitalization and climate. Climate policy and digital policy, um, they are actually um, separated on two different planets because climate policy is top on the agenda again. That is thanks to Fridays for Future. So it is the subject of a political debate um, after the crisis or between our lockdowns. There are more and more demonstrations, but there are also a lot of governments in the world that unfortunately, well, they do only little, but now they seem to put more emphasis on these topics. Last year, Germany decided to phase out of coal and there are also other countries um, well lagging behind like Japan but even these countries they try to focus on zero emissions they want to have zero emissions by 2050 the United States however well they won't achieve they haven't achieved this goal yet and the Green Deal is also one of the main um, priorities of the EU. But when we talk about climate protection, it's mostly about less, um, less emissions le and less energy consumption in order to be able to have this transformation towards 100% renewable energies, less consumption, less transport and less movement of goods. But when it comes to the digital policy, well, it's different because digitalization is mentioned in the Green Deal, but rather to strike the balance between the environment and the economy. And in order to be a driver of growth in Germany, the idea is to have a value adult of 125 million and the industrial Internet of Things that is supported by Germany. Um, this idea that Germany is a world leader in export and this should be promoted and within the European Union artificial intelligence is considered to be the main growth driver and in Brussels and other countries the idea is to really promote AI in order to foster growth but in order not in, in order to catch up with China and the United States because they have made even more progress. And so I think it's quite clear that digital policy is always focusing on economic growth, which is very different from the objectives set by our climate policy. So my first idea is that we should unite these two ideas. Germany, of course, is an exception. In the past two or three years, there was a lot of debate going on about digitalization and sustainability. And the Ministry of the Environment, well, has really made great efforts. But if you look into other countries or great um, companies, then digitalization and climate protection strategies seems to be two different things and 
uh, people do not really focus on the risks of these two spheres. So it's a bit schizophrenic because we have digitalization on the one hand and climate on the other hand. Both, of course, are on top of the agenda, but both have different objectives. So we will not be able to control climate change if we go on business as usual. But this is what digitalization is supposed to do, just to be a driver of um, conquering new markets, manipulating consumers, and also as a kind of lubricant for financial transactions. So the first a thesis is digital policy and climate policy can be found on two different planets. But what about opportunities and risks? Um, there are just a few highlights that I would like to mention. If digitalization and uh, climate policy is considered to be part of the same thing, then it's usually efficiency that is focused on because people think that due to digitalization, everything's getting more virtu virtual. This helps us save resources. And if you focus on the climate, then people think that digitalization helps to make many processes more efficient, which of course will help to reduce CO2 emissions. But this is the assumption, and it's a debate that has been going on for 25 years. In the beginning of the year 2000, there were some analyses, and they tried to find out whether it's better to have a newspaper skips, uh, subscription online than really having a physical newspaper. And a few years later, there was uh, the debate whether it's better to have an MP3 download instead of buying a CD. And then there were more more debates about video streaming, there were different studies and ideas, but usually people think, well, if you go to your video store taking your car, well, and you will need 33% more energy than just looking at a streamed video. So there are a lot of examples. There are smart heating systems, for example. Um, there are some empirical studies showing that you can save about 33% of energy by um, optimizing heating control. But of course, these are rather theoretical ways of saving energy. But I'm a sociologist. So what I would like to know is go beyond these technical innovations in order to find out how the actual consumption, the use, has been changing. For example, introducing online news or digital music and uh, video. Um, so what does this mean when it comes comes to energy and CO2 emissions. And I think it's quite clear that there are a lot of different effects that actually offset um, these uh, potentials of saving energy because, uh, well, printed media, um, well, feels like um, environmental pollution, but on the other hand, there are tweets and blogs, and of course, they all need to be generated. There's a lot of data traffic, and you need a lot of electricity. When it comes to music, it's not about downloading MP3s, but actually it is streamed, and sometimes, well, you will stream it several times if it's your favorite song. And even those who download their Spotify libraries, well, they will have a much bigger music library on their smartphone or their tablet than in the past. Streaming, of course, when it comes to audience ratings, well, they are they've remained the same and then you have to add streaming onto it and then there's the last example smartphone systems because we had a study going on about resource protection potential so we looked into 500 households in Germany and we found out that on average well, the average smartphone system consists of 10 different devices. So you have the heating control system and you have a lot of other devices, sensors for humidity, home security cameras. 
smoke detectors and all these devices, of course, uh, they uh, also consume a lot of electricity and will cause CO2 emissions. And so the bottom line is rebound effects, induction effects, growth effects will have changed our consumption and our behavior, which means they off they have offset um, this saving potential. So this is like a zero-sum game when it comes to climate protection. My third thesis, how could it be better? That's also something you can learn from corona in uh, some way, because uh, during the corona crisis we saw that when digitalization is systematically substituted, then uh, emissions can be considerably reduced. I'm not saying that's the blueprint as to how it's supposed to go, but it is a teaching. You can see how it should be shaped, because uh, we saw that during the peak in the corona crisis uh, in April, we had 26% less emissions, especially through reduced traffic. For 2020, globally speaking, we are expecting 4 to 7 percent less emissions. In Germany, we're talking about 30 to 100 million tons. That's about what Germany should do every year to do its fair share in climate policy issues. And uh, this crisis was very important here. We had 50 to 80 percent less traffic, but 100. 20% more video conferences. And video conferences, of course, also need electricity. But net, there's a net reduction because you have much less than when uh, driving a car or commuting by car or by aeroplane. And uh, digitization has also showed here that uh, when uh, using digitization, we can uh, drastically reduce emissions without having to build on artificial intelligence, the Internet of the Things or anything, but just using the existing potential uh, in terms of infrastructure and terminal devices. So what we should do would be to reduce the digital divide because uh, during the crisis, uh, during lockdown, of course, those families or employees who had less access to digital devices and the Internet, of course, uh, were at a disadvantage. But as a country, I can say that... Uh, this was sufficient. We didn't uh, see the net, uh, the internet being overloaded or anything just because we had more video conferences. But uh, with the existing potential, emissions could be drastically reduced. And uh, the challenge now will be to continue with this, uh, not the corona crisis, of course, but this substitution. How can we as a society see to it that digitization can uh, substitute analog, fossil, material-intensive uh, matters uh, rather than just having it on top as an addition? I think it's quite clear that the new normal after the crisis, when at some point uh, time there will be a time after the crisis, then it'll not be more digital. It could, well, it will be more digital, but it could be an add-on. People could still be traveling, taking airplanes, commuting, uh, plus also having a particularly, you know, a lot of more video conferences and so on. And my last thesis, after the third one, substitution. Now we have uh, the fourth one. Digitization especially has a large potential, but also some risks in terms of transforming the sectors. For example, energy transition, uh, decentralizing energy with 100% renewables, that will be more digital, of course. I don't want to go into this. Then a change in terms of mobility away from the car, more car sharing, public transport, and so on. So mobility, we will also have service platforms. That will be one central element, again, based on digitization. So I want to talk more about a transition in consumption patterns because it also fits into the topic of growth, which I touched upon with my first thesis. Now, digitization, even in the, over the past years, has already provided us with quite a few tools for more sustainable consumption. So what do we mean by consuming more sus sustainably? There are two components. First of all, more sustainable production products, which have been produced more socially sustainable manner, and uh, also consuming less 
because in Germany, at least in these highly industrialized countries, we have too much consumption, not good for the climate. And so now we would talk about sufficiency in consumption and digitization can do a lot towards this. We saw that in the past with eBay, that's an older story, and uh, platforms, sharing platforms, platforms for secondhand things, uh, having easy access to building plans, uh, to repairs and so on. But there the problem is, or was still is, that uh, this uh, may still be a niche because it's you need intrinsically motivated consumers wanting to do that. Who watches do-it-yourself videos on YouTube? Some people do, but uh, usually completely different videos are streamed which would rather incentivize towards consuming more. And so we, have, we need to have uh, more aware consumers. We don't have enough of them, usually. And then also a large share of consumption is done on the basis of habits. So you have a point of sale, you have ad hoc purchases uh, spontaneously, and uh, there you have uh, these offers for sharing and that which will only have a limited effect. They're just not perceived. And uh, I'd like to tell you now that we're starting on a new research project. I'm giving you a little secret here. It started two weeks ago, and uh, it's not about low-tech, but high-tech. Tech. We're using artificial intelligence, but we want to promote sustainable consumerism. So nudging, that's what it's about. So we want to have uh, the free choice for the consumers, but we want to give them information and uh, somehow twitch the infrastructure a little bit for decision making so that it's easier to make more sustainable decisions in consuming or consuming more ecological products. So we will set up a green consumption assistant which will be a tool helping people to choose more sustainable products or find um, alternatives to purchasing. There we are cooperating with Nicosia and at the Technical University, my team, we also have a, a professor, also with a professor from Boyd University who specializes in artificial intelligence and we are developing a green shopping assistant which will help provide consumers with sustainability information. So it's not like Idealo comparison of prices or just taking the first things which pop up in the advertisement, but also search under social and ecological criteria. That can happen through pop-ups, through consultancy information, advice, uh, anyway. In the smartphone app, it could also work differently. And what do we want to do? We want uh, to hand out information so that people know where to find more alternative products or alternatives to purchasing. And we also want to have transparency in the label jungle. We have 80 different animal welfare labels. You know, nobody really knows what is really sustainable or what is just greenwashing. And something which is also important, at the point of sale where people make decisions, we want immediately to give them an alternative with a link where, for example, they have the most uh, energy-saving uh, fridge or fair, pr fairly produced t-shirt or other alternatives. So what are we going to do? We are going to build up a large sustainable product database and then we will have criteria under which uh, sustainable options can be assessed. and then you want to have not just more sustainable products, but also alternatives like repair, sharing, uh, uh, workshops, whatever. And then we want to develop the tool on the platform and we also want to have uh, social sciences research combined with this because all this can be very energy intensive. We don't know exactly how energy intensive it will be, but what we do know from imaging processes or image analysis processes that artificial intelligence, which can just uh, differentiate between uh, a squirrel and uh, another feline, will have to see thousands of pictures and reiteration all the time to be able to learn to how to differentiate. And somebody in Massachusetts then has calculated that that would be 248 megatons, to 284 tons of carbon dioxide being emitted. That is horrendous. 
So we will always have to monitor to see how energy intensive our green shopping assistant it is and how to avoid uh, <coughs> going falling into the trap so that we can contribute towards uh, the climate. So we want to transition in consumer patterns, but we don't want to just use the AI hype towards growth, but we would rather want to contribute towards less consumer consumption and uh, we should learn how to consume less and still be happy. And that is also a social matter. So my fifth thesis, uh, that is also a bit my conclusion, is that I believe that uh, to ha make a breakthrough here, we need a very strong political will. Uh, politics will have to shape the process. Firstly, digitization, uh, climate protection, environmental protection, all that has to be one thing. We need policy coherence here rather than uh, being schizophrenic and saying here we want growth and there we want sustainability. But we also have to be uh, very consistent here, not only in Germany, but also in Europe. So the EU Council, I hope, will also show up certain uh, possibilities as to how to use and shape digitization towards sustainable achievements. For example, that you have more labeling for the computer centers, data centers, and the devices have a longer period of life uh, with uh, guarantees or the right to repair warranties. Uh, longer lasting or the fact that software updates have to be provided uh, right to the end of the life cycle of the product and so on and so forth. So we ho hope for political shaping of this process, not only in Germany, but also at an EU level. And I hope that we've also been able to make a contribution here in uh, an opinion we gave to the European Parliament about how uh, digitization and globalization can go together. Um, this will be published in three weeks' time in Brussels. And then we don't want to have these rebound uh, effects, and therefore we need digital sufficiency as little digitization as uh, necessary as much as as little as as much as necessary and uh, as little as possible and uh, then i talked about substitution of digitization with the example of uh, the teachings from the corona crisis and i would say okay we need a right for the working from the home office, but on the other hand, also more drastic measures to make traffic less attractive and transport so that uh, digitization can substitute uh, traffic streams. And uh, digitization is also, if you want to make it, uh, make digitization work for the climate, we will have to support it. We have to support projects and products, uh, research projects, which don't necessarily derive from the industrial sector. But if we want to have uh, um, digitization and high tech, then we will need public finances here. And uh, we hope to contribute to this, but we will also need more public tenders, which uh, also see to it that sustainability is taken into account uh, also promoting such projects, mobility as a service platforms, data banks for databases for traffic and so on. And there's a lot of room for improvement. Yes, thank you for listening and I will be very happy to have a very intriguing discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tillman. There were a lot of interesting ideas and we could discuss forever. We just have 20 minutes for a discussion. But I would like to point out that we have the slider.com tool. So please ask questions and we'll try to answer them. Tillman Santarius will answer this question because I won't be able to do that. Well, we'll see. And before discussing, well, consumption, political shaping, technology, I would like to get back to your presentation. You said 
that there is uh, that there will be a green consumption assistance and sounds very promising so it seems to tie in very nicely in this idea of green growth so what is this tools supposed to do in order to prevent these rebound effects because we don't want to consume more even if it's green consumption because this is not the objective of the goal the tool wants us to do something different so what do you do in order to prevent these rebound effects this term green consumption well um this is, of course, a bit, a bit strange term because this is not about increasing green consumption. You don't want people to consume more. This is what I try to explain here. This is not only about consuming more products, even if they are fairly produced, but we don't want people to consume that much. Well, what is important about the design of the tool? It must be really sustainable. Well, if you develop this database collecting information on consumption decisions that are really sustainable, but then there are others that we should not recommend because it's rather greenwashing. And it's not only about products, it's also about companies. So which are the companies that are to be recommended? And then there are other companies um, that have really high emissions as legates, well, we, of course, we have to find a compromise here because we really want a model based on strong sustainability and we would like to recommend products and sharing options that are genuinely um, sustainable. And I think this is what matters most. We have a combination, we have a AI professor and I have great expertise on sufficiency and sustainable consumption and Ecosia, Ecosia is a partner that is not um, focusing on profit but on purpose. It's quite small opposed to Google but there are 50 million search requests every day but Ecosia is not really interested in increasing their safety but they really want to develop a green consumption assistant, even if this means that they have um, a lower turnover. So first of all, a strong focus on sustainability. Um, the second thing is that we will do research, a lot of research while this assistant is running. So it's not only about AI and our reduction potential. We really want to find out, do consumers really use our tool? How are they going? Going to use this tool, uh, maybe the consumption will even increase because they think, well, it's a fairly produced T-shirt, so I will buy three instead of one. So we would really like to respond to potential rebound effects. I think this is really an innovation because usually people think that we will um, just um, try to promote green product. So this tool should also be able to learn. It's based on AI and you use this term of nudging, pointing out green products, nudging the consumers. It's very similar to the Corona app. This is a high risk encounter. Don't buy this. Is this possible? Yeah, I think so. This I think this is possible because we um, work in a team and we focus on sufficiency-oriented marketing together with Avocado, Avocado Store. So together with other companies, we would try to find out what will this message do, saying don't buy this. Maybe this is helpful. Well, be improving the image and at the same time reducing consumption. This is really interesting, quite an interesting issue. Uh, there's another term that we've just heard and that is digital sufficiency. In connection with a motto that I found in Smart Green World, as much digitization as necessary and as little as possible. 
or well, maybe you can go into detail here. What are the sectors affected? Where do we need a lot of digital sufficiency? Well, can you differentiate? Well, yeah, that's if you read this book, Smart Green World. Well, but I can tell you that details because there are a lot of international researchers that really try to go into depth uh, here and we also will hand this as a journal. First of all we have hardware sufficiency and what matters here most is it's really the operational life of the device that should be as long as possible and it should be possible to repair them. Secondly it's about software sufficiency because when it comes to software you really need to have this sufficiency element in mind. For example, if you look at your browsers, there are a lot of different energy consumptions, Firefox, Safari or Chrome. Chrome, for example, well, it's consuming a lot of ele electricity. Don't use Chrome, not only for energy saving reasons, but also for data protection reasons. But in this case, actually, it's both. You should really try to avoid Google, not only for reasons of data privacy, but when it comes to software, well, there's quite a trivial case. There are these loops on Netflix or Google, they want you to do some binge watching. This is what they do when programming digital services, but you really need to focus on sufficiency, hardware sufficiency, software sufficiency, but on the one hand, there is, of course, user sufficiency at an individual level. And again, you should really ask yourself whether you need a new smartphone every year and new services. But the question is, how can you use digitization in order to be as sufficient as possible in your life? Well, it starts with food. Um, but there's also mobility, for example. Then there is economic sufficiency, and this ties in nicely with my last thesis. Digital, we as a society should use digitization in order to, well, achieve a decentralized degrowth economy. So this digitization should not be used in order to have a transnational economy with a lot of movement of goods and trying to optimize our output. What we should do is have decentralized production in a democratic way, and really changing a system. So I'm not as naive as Jeremy Rifkin. It, well, there will be no implosion of capitalism, but I think there is a potential. So this is what economic sufficiency should do. You often talk about incremental, about soft digitization. So it seems that we can optimize our behavior, but maybe there will be some disruptive moments. I would like to read this out to you because you're one of the few scientists, academics that really try to look into the future. And you have an idea about the year 2030. And you said one way is of preventing a rebound uh, effect that more efficient technology will lead to more consumption is the imperative of inaction, an advertising ban, a ban on manipulation. But, well, I think this would mean that the social, that the business model for social media would actually be obsolete. Well, this business model of social media, yes, that's true, but not the business model of social media themselves. The idea is that people can exchange information and of course, you can uphold this model and you can have a different um, model that you use for it. There are different pay options because you don't... When it comes to Facebook, for example, 
you have millions of advertising re revenue, but you don't have to manipulate, manipulate the users in order to do so, because the current business model um, of social media really tries to manipulate consumers by optimizing their ads in a very subtle way. This will become obsolete if we focus on sustainability in the future. And this is really this imperative of in action. But it's not only this ban on manipulation or advertising ban, it also has AI in mind. Because even if we have this green consumption assistant that takes consumption or purchase decisions for us, well, this should be transparent because we don't want to take this decision-making away from our citizens. You really need to be transparent. And this imperative of an action should really prevent companies from manipulating consumers. So as soon as you provide information, you should be transparent so people can decide in favor or against it. You also mentioned Germany is an important economic location. There's, for example, the Gaia X, a European project where we try to build infrastructure to, but there are also very specific examples, best practice. You mentioned streaming. What I'm thinking of is MP3 in Nuremberg and Erlang at the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits. There is a case of 1.3 billion bits, and it was reduced by 12 times, which is a lot of data reduction. This worked quite well. There was a lot of good research done by Dieter Weitzer, but it took about 10 years in order to achieve this. Do you think this is also possible when it comes to um, other media, video, for example, because um, you were referring to streaming and downloading, so maybe we should not use high resolution. Do you think it's better to download a film? Well, when it comes to technological possibilities, well, I can't really tell you because I'm a sociologist, so I won't come up with such a revolutionary innovation like MP3, but when it comes to data well, reduction, sufficiency should not be understood as um, lower life quality, and I don't like MP3. I don't like sound quality, but if I use my smartphone, it's fine because sound quality is quite poor anyway. So I'm not against MP3, but I don't think it's the solution because I'm a musician and I don't like this. I need good sound quality. I wouldn't use MP3 at home, but it's fine if you have your devices. And this, uh, the same applies to streaming. Let's say you have a really big uh, screen and this is a high definition film, it's fine, but if you watch a film using your smartphone, you don't need high resolution with a lot of data transfer. And this is what we should do. So the, you should at least have a default option adjusting streaming resolution to your end device. It would be even better to have a default option always opting for um, low resolution. So this might be a low-tech solution and maybe you can even do more. So this was a technical question. Now you said that AI also sometimes has an energy problem and uh, it might be even worse now because we're talking about neural networks controlling each other and uh, that is very energy intensive and uh, these uh, networks have to learn and that also costs a lot of energy if you have them self-learning. So what are the solutions? Do we really need AI everywhere where we need it? Is, is that a, a possibility or 
Is there hope, let's say, to have these kind of springboard innovations? We have a federal agency promoting this, for example, analog computers, which can be much faster and would use much less energy. Um, there we had a software entrepreneur from the open source movement, uh, Rafael Laguna, doing that. What do you think about it? Well, springboard innovation, I can imagine that, but as I said, I'm the wrong person. But I think there's a risk that springboard innovation could lead to the fact that in many cases there'll be more AI being used where otherwise you would not have used it just because it's so cheaper, easier, probably faster as well. And uh, then we have these rebound effects, uh, which are pre-bound effects, really. You can uh, uh, expect them to happen anyway. And the same, by the way, with 5G. I mean, 5G, okay, you can, of course, uh, use only a ten thousandth uh, part of the energy for data transfer, but it won't lead to using less energy, but to more data being transferred. So only if this is being... Uh, controlled and you also have planks and guidelines, so to speak, only then can you really have energy savings. And so I think your first point was also uh, very probable, yes. So we look first to see where the true potential for AI lies. Uh, this is a, has been a buzzword for some time now, but uh, you write AI onto all sorts of boxes without thinking uh, about whether or not it should have AI. AI in it in the first place. But in, well, we're only going to use it selectively, though. If we look at the product database, we can do it with traditional methods. We don't even need AI. So even if we have an AI-projected tool and are developing this, we will only have AI in it selectively. So I have no idea how to regulate this or incentivize this at the political level. I doubt uh, that that higher um, electricity taxes, energy taxes would help, for example, with streaming. But whether that would be applicable to the development of AI instruments and algorithms, I wouldn't know. That's also highly intriguing. So how can AI one day be regulated? Uh, what kind of a framework uh, could there be and sufficiency? saying, again, as uh, little AI as uh, necessary, as possible, as much as necessary. And you said, okay, you talked about negative growth and uh, sufficiency, which could uh, go together. We haven't arrived there yet, but uh, so far, at the moment, we do have negative growth. So I think it'll be difficult to explain to the population that this uh, is uh, something we want to see in the future. Well, the difference is that... Uh, we have this is now disaster-bound negative growth, whereas degrowth is a very clear path. It's been shaped and uh, it's an objective. Yeah, but I meant to say something else because you also briefly mentioned uh, quality of life. You said if we work with digital sufficiency and then we have a future vector whereby it's shaped, then we would gain uh, in life quality, we work, make gains. What do you mean by that? What would it mean? And how do you define quality of life? Well, I'll uh, give you another example. In my research, I also deal with social acceleration, so acceleration of uh, the pace of life. And over the past two years, I've had a quite a co comprehensive uh, research uh, project on acceleration and digitization. And I think if this was combined with degrowth or digital sufficiency, then we wouldn't have the effect that uh, we use the advantages of digitization, but at the same time, we also accelerate our pace of life. But no, we could prom ha use these promises of uh, technology. I mean, these uh, predate digitization that you say, okay, the machines will do things for us and we will have more time for the nice things. I mean, that was the promise of industrialization. You thought if we had the first um, uh, fresh... Um, machine for the farmers, then you said, okay, you will have more time now. And uh, But that has always meant that uh, time gained by technological progress has then uh, led to acceleration elsewhere. And I've seen that uh, there's a clear combination and connectivity 
connectedness in Germany between uh, the grade of digitization of uh, a person or a population and the pace of life. And uh, this is really a vicious circle which has to be broken because uh, you have more digitization leading to more transport, more meetings, more activities in the 24-hour period, because uh, then we will not be able to live the good life we are hoping for. So binge-watching wouldn't be part of this uh, quality of life, watching Netflix. So now let's see what's happening on Slido, what kind of questions have we had. So we'd like to turn to the audience, if you can see and hear us. So Morris Tim from A. E G. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture and the very good moderation. Now, we have seen many questions uh, on the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial aspect, aspect, and uh, the highest voted question was, will sharing or sufficiency always find a majority? Shouldn't we rather have a strict uh, monitoring of the environment of the companies? This is Olive Winterman asking. Yeah, good question. I think it's good because it's not an either or. I think we need environmental monitoring and sufficiency. Sufficiency alone will not suffice. It's a well-known thing in uh, discussing sustainability. The combination of uh, sufficiency, increase of efficiency and consistency, so the circular economy, uh, that on its own is, is still not enough. But I mean, the question is whether or not you'll find a majority in the public opinion. And I think, yes, uh, sufficiency very often, at least here in Germany, is often misunderstood as uh, not having something and uh, I think uh, that is just a problem we would have as soon as we leave academia. And I'm not sure I would like to talk to a broad audience all the time about sufficiency. But, um, but certainly this gain in quality of life that is uh, not um, – people don't realize that that exists. So – I say, okay, I am using these digital tools, but I also have more time for the things uh, which are really important to me. And I think that is something most people would subscribe to, or a combination of uh, saying, okay, I use sharing offers which are more easily accessible, for example, with this green some consumption assistance. Nowadays, maybe it's difficult for many people even to have access to a sharing system, but when that's made easier, then I don't have the obligation anymore to talking about a car, to deal with uh, repairs, parking, purchasing a car, insurance, I can just use it. And at the same time, I still have time left over and probably also money to do other things. So this combination of uh, a gain in quality of life and transformation, that is something which will find um, a um, positive echo. Because very often people think, okay, they have to um, miss out on something, and that's not true. Sh shall we continue? Then uh, we have some more questions. So here's a question from Christian Katzenbach here. He asks, digitization goes through all areas of life and so many social concepts have changed, private sphere, the sphere of work and so on. Is that true also for the concept of sustainability? And then Martin Schmidt asks, um, does it also mean that the concept of the environment changes through digitalization? Well, cool, these questions. The last one is rather philosophical. What is the environment? Especially when the environment is becoming more and more to a co-world uh, by the use of uh, digital tools like drone-planted trees for reforestation and such things. I think the concept of sustainability has not yet changed. And um, yes, there were some attempts of Talk, to talk, talking about sustainability 4.0 as if something had changed, but I believe that is uh, 
not the case. You can't really substantiate this. There's not a really a new concept. And I think that uh, is the case because sustainability is something at uh, the level of a goal, an objective. And this strange term of digitization, I keep using it. Uh, many people actually reject the term, and they're quite right even. But um, th this should only be a means for achieving an objective. Digitization itself is not an objective, it's just a toolbox. Sustainability is uh, its about keeping to the planetary resilience boundaries or having more fairness. So I think that these concepts uh, do not collide very much, but they can actually be very well combined. And uh, I do see this debate we've had over the past years uh, about green IT. That was some time ago. Then we had ICT for green, and then we have the debate uh, also in our work on uh, digitization towards a socio-ecological transition. Not really a difference in the concept of sustainability. Thank you. Then a more historic question, Martin Schwick. Digitization did not begin 10 year, 20 years ago. Is there uh, an interlinkage between communication, globalization, and the environment between the 1980s and 90s, for example, offshoring of industrial project products? Uh, please repeat the question. Now, digitization didn't start 20 or 40 years ago. That's true. But what was the real question? I'll read it out. It's very high, voted up very high, and we are very democratic. Sometimes it's difficult to understand. So digitization did not begin 20 years ago. Is there a connection between digitization of communication, globalization, and the environment in the 1980s and 90s, for example, with offshoring of industrial products? I suppose it's about a parallel, a parallel to today, with today. And, well, offshoring industrial production, I suppose the buzzword would be globalization. So the transnationalization of production chains, uh, chains and they, of course, uh, very much rely on digitization. And uh, we would have to go back at least into the 80s, maybe the 70s, when the banks began di to digitize their capital flows. And then they had digital uh, financial transfers, but then also the management of uh, these uh, hundreds of, you know, fragmented production chains where one pair of jeans is produced at seven or 12 different production sites with all sorts of suppliers in between. That was only made possible through digitization. And it does mean that that has a very, ha has had a strong impact impact on sustainability and the concept of sustainability because globalization has changed the debate on sustainability. But this debate, of course, to be honest, we've only seen it since 1987 or 92 at Rio when it was global. But before that, it was about the environment, the whole debate. And uh, it did not very much focus on feedback loops with uh, international fairness. I mean, that was the breakthrough at the Rio summit, that sustainability and development, fairness and ecology, the north and the south, that all that was combined. So if you now think once around the corner and say that digitization certainly shaped globalization, and globalization was then changed the debate which was on the ecology and protecting nature and then turned it into a debate on sustainability, then I would subscribe to that, yes. And uh, next topic, uh, we're talking about regulation. We were talking about uh, companies, but now on the green consumption assistant. Now, why is this approach this is what they means. The assistant not thought at an entrepreneurial level, maybe as a monet not as a monetary 
tool for consumers. Green is probably the largest marketing tool of very many industry sectors. Well, I think this might be possible to develop this in cooperation with companies at corporate level, especially our sustainability database, because there are also some companies that have joined us. Well, we we'll see how um, intense our cooperation is going to be, but on the one hand, we have this search engine and this mapping service, and the idea is to provide alternative information to our consumers, so you can really use this, this, these mechanisms powering our shop assistant, our shopping assistant, and of course this can be used to track companies and you can provide tools that will help companies to change. Well, it's definitely possible. The question is whether we will be able to do all this at the same time and maybe we should rather focus on other um, people and companies that are interested in cooperating with us and I would like to encourage them to try and cooperate with us. Well, this shopping assistant has quite positive feedback and here it says it's a great idea, but how can you identify the resources that are used by one product if you look at the whole value chain? Even Ecosia uses a Microsoft search engine and is funded by ads. So. What about the connection with the green shopping assistant? Well, the first question is very easy to answer, but it's quite difficult to implement, actually, because we have to use life cycle analyses. Um, they are already in place for a number of uh, products, and maybe we can add some information to this. F the footprint of a T-shirt, for example, well, there are a lot of LCAs, so you don't need to reinvent them, but so LCA is a best practice tool, but it's not that easy because we have so many products and we need to combine all this data and we need to evaluate and assess them because it's really supposed to be uh, sustainable. We don't want to green wash any products here. And the second part of the question, well, the second part was referring to Ecosia, Ecosia and Bing. Well, it's not really ideal. I don't know whether it's better if Ecosia was cooperating with Google, so it's really up to you to decide this and to assess this. I don't know, well, which company is better, Microsoft or Google? Well, I think there are a lot of critical points with both companies. Ecosia decided very early on, so at least this is, this is my perspective, they said, all right, we'll play your game, so we will need advertising re revenues generated by Bing or Yahoo, but we will use this re revenue in order to plant trees for our purpose. So this is an important change in strategy. Be and they said, uh, we want to be even more sustainable at the front end with the user. Who knows? So I guess we'll also try to reach out to Google and Bing and talk to them and try and find out whether a green consumption assistant might be a good idea for their platform too. And maybe we can help them to transform too. But of course, I don't want to get expe uh, raise expecta expectations too high. So Christiane said this was all very fast. I think she was referring to your presentation. But her question is, what are the sustainability criteria that you use for software and hardware products and how do you assess commercial um, databases? So the sustainability criteria for software and hardware, what are the sustainability criteria that you use for your recommendations for your shopping system and how do you assess commercial 
databases. Well, there's not one set of sustainability criteria because, well, when it comes to hardware, we're talking about sustainability. Today, we try to, I try to focus on climate. It's not only about the CO2 footprint, but we would also like to consider toxic substances that are being used or the conditions under which they are being produced. I'm not only talking about um, rare um, earth or um, toxic substances that are used, but also toxic, uh, toxic substances in the factories. But we should be even more open when it comes to software. It is more open when it comes to software because there's a lot of research that needs to be done. There's the Karl Manifesto where there are some principles. And there is a very interesting study. One of the co-authors of the paper that we are developing, Lorenz Hilti from Zurich, and together with others, he did so um, on behalf of the Federal Ministry of the Environment. But well, we still have some toothing problems here. So of course, there are a lot of. Um, well, we, there's a lot of work that remains to be um, done. Maybe we can hear another uh, one more question. I think there's one question that is particularly appropriate referring to climate change. It's a more personal question. Given disastrous uh, forecasts on climate change, how can you be so optimistic about it? Well, that's the only thing that makes sense and that is fun. There's no point in turning a blind eye to everything and ignoring the developments because the more you know, the more you have to do. It's the same with property. So once you learn more and more about climate change and man-made climate change, well, I really feel obliged to bring about change. And it's always better to be optimistic about it, and um, ev especially if you want to encourage others to join. So I don't want to be a doomonger here. But, well, we should be clear about 1.5 degrees. Well, we won't achieve that. It doesn't seem possible. But it's uh, really worth fighting for, well, um, every cent of a great, because there is a big difference whether it's 2.2 .2 or 2.3 or 2.5 degrees of global warming. So optimism makes sense. We have to fight for every bit. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting and intriguing question, and uh, thanks for watching. And I have a philo philosophical uh, question first, a linguistical question about terms in English and German that we use, because there were two questions referring to the referring to the environment. I was not quite sure whether this was referring to environment, because we talked about globalization of all spheres of life and now we're talking about the digitization of all spheres of life this uh, seems to be what happens if you use a capitalistic uh, term so we often talk about digitization or digitalization but Usually, uh, what is more common is digital transformation. And I think this is a process that is much easier to shape because digitalization sounds like an agent that is really present in all spheres of life. And then you get feel like you can't really act on that. Maybe these terms are not really helpful. I de well, I definitely agree. And well, the connotation of English and German terms are different sometimes. I think there is a big difference between digitization and digitalization because digitization is a technical term. Digitalization, however, is a process of social change. So this is really the change in our society well, due to, well, maybe not due to, but in the context of the use of digital tools and algorithms. 
digital transformation, however, is a term I would not like to use because I think transformation is a term that I would like to use for sustainability. So digital as an adjective to transformation is not the, the right thing to do. We need an environmental transformation and a social transformation and maybe it's a digital transformation in some places, for example, when it comes to digital sufficiency. But a transformation should be a separate term. The political question actually refers to our sovereignty, sovereignty in Germany and Europe and our role within this transformation. This is what you're mentioning in your book. You said in Germany we have the government, the public sector is a big client, a big customer when it comes to information technology. It's 25%. So this is much more in many other Western countries. So the government, the state is a big player that could really help shaping this transformation. Do you think this might be a locational advantage of Germany? Germany uh, being a big player, or don't you think this is important? Yes, I think it's definitely a competitive advantage because there are a lot of digital companies. Well, I don't think in this happens in China, but many of these companies, they really try to focus on envir environmental protection, but then there are other dimensions of sustainability that are being ignored. Well, CO2 has the objective of being carbon neutral but they do so by the revenues that they generate from surveillance and the monopolization of markets. So in this case, well, environmental and social aspects, well, they are quite a chaos here. So I don't think this really is a competitive advantage because in the United States, there are some companies that really try to focus on sustainability and they have come a long way and they might have a stronger commitment to climate protection than states in Europe. So maybe uh, there's no point in just focusing on European policies, but uh, it might be I would be happy to see a debate at a European level and the link between decarbonization and uh, digitalization. And then maybe we can really use this as a competitive advantage here in Europe. So the question as to whether the whether digitalization should be sacrificed um, f uh, to this um, idea of uh, growth? Well, we haven't answered this question yet. We will, of course, continue this series on the 23rd or 24th of November. So it's the 23rd of November with Lisa Gdenczyk, and we will continue on Monday. Uh, thank you very much, Tilman Santarius. This was really a great. What a great presentation. Very intriguing. And thanks for joining us today. It was really um, great, and of course, I will stay a few more minutes, and I'm happy to answer your questions, also online questions, and I'm always happy to see people that want to cooperate or join us. Thank you.